Hello, so let me begin this topic with this concept called electronegativity. Now, electronegativity describes the tendency of an atom or the functional group to attract electrons or electron density to itself. It means that how easy for this element to attract electrons to itself. Now, we have a scale for electronegativity for all the elements in the whole periodic table, and these are some of the numbers that you should know. You don't have to know the exact value, but you should know the relative values, which one is higher, which one is lower. We know for sure that fluorine is the boss. In the whole periodic table, fluorine is the most reactive non-metal. It likes to grab any electrons around. Basically, it's like electronegativity means right, you arrange a single atom of all the elements in the whole periodic table in a whole campfire in a circular form and I throw in one electron right in the middle of the campfire and who will get six electrons first? The one that has the highest value for electronegativity, in this case fluorine, will grab it first. But now, let's say fluorine is not part of the campfire. All the rest of the elements are. Then, who will grab it? Yes, oxygen, because it's second boss, right? Second highest electronegativity value. So what if F and O are not there? Then the next one will go in and grab it, which is chlorine. So, so on and so forth. For oxygen gas, this is how it looks like. The electron density is quite symmetrical, evenly distributed. And for hydrogen fluoride gas, very harmful to us, electron density is unevenly distributed. So we call them polarized because electron cloud is a bit not balanced, it's slanted towards one side, it's bigger. And this is water molecule, again, it's not very symmetrical. So what are inductive and resonance effect? Now for inductive effect, what we have is a group that will push electron or pull electron through the sigma bond. Remember that the sigma bond is the first covalent bond that's formed between two atoms. The first one. For the second and third covalent bond that's being formed, we call them pi bonds. For the inductive effect, what matters is the sigma bond. Now we pull electron through the bond, but doesn't mean I remove it. It's more of like pulling closer to myself. That's all. Okay, I'm still holding to it, but pulling closer. So the effect depends on the electronegative atoms, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine. And this effect dies down rapidly after the first bond. So this is not that strong. It's like only one bond that can do it. Think of tug of war. Okay, so see here. Chlorine like to pull electrons from the sigma bond. Oxygen pulls electron from the sigma bond. Now we have the resonance effect. This means that you have some sort of electron sharing through arrow pushing. So this what gives rise to resonance structures. You find resonance effect when you see lone pairs of electrons, and we see pi bonds and empty orbitals. Now, nitrogen having lone pair is more effective than oxygen because it is less electronegative. Less electronegative means that it doesn't want electrons so much. So, nitrogen is a bit generous compared to oxygen for electrons because oxygen wants it so bad. So, it's a bit stingy towards giving electron. This example illustrates what it means by resonance effect. Nitrogen here uses its lone pair of electrons and push to the adjacent CN bond so that the carbon can fuel the electron. And after which, you see that both carbon and nitrogen, they are octet, very stable, having eight electrons around themselves. Oxygen can do likewise, but just now I mentioned that oxygen is a pro-electron pair donor. Halogens is quite weak because of thing doing that, it is not that stable. So for the pi electrons, what happens is right, I can shift this pi bond to the other side, we get the C negative, we get the C positive. Now we use this arrow here because they are resonance structure. These are double hit arrow, double hit arrow, single line. Okay, it's not the same as the equilibrium one. Let me draw for you again. Resonance, we use this arrow. This is for equilibrium reactions. So they are different. So as mentioned just now, inductive effect, we have 
pulling or pushing electrons through the sigma bond, this is how it goes using a group as well. So the CO bond, because it's polarized, we have the carbon that's taking a delta positive, delta negative on the oxygen, it pulls electrons in this manner. Same goes for cyano group, delta plus, delta minus, and we have a net positive on the nitrogen in the NO2 group, the nitro group, and this is very, very electron withdrawing. For the resonance effect, we are using arrow pushing from the electrons. So you see for this carbon, we have got one lone pair. We know that because it carries a negative charge, goes in, pushing electrons, form a pi bond, and then this pi bond is going to give way because carbon can't accommodate more than 8 electrons around itself. So right now it's got 8. But if we wish to form another pi bond with the adjacent carbon, then you're going to break the existing pi bond with the oxygen. This is still fine because it is still bonded to the oxygen. Now someone asks, which is a better form? The answer is pretty obvious, it is this form here. The reason is because now you compare the main difference is O carries a negative charge compared to the carbon that carries a negative charge. And because oxygen is more electronegative, it prefers to hold on to more electron density. And that's why this is preferred. Same goes for the second case, this is preferred. Same goes for the third case, that's preferred. This is a good summary for you for this table. The functional groups, family name, and when they're named as substituents, what do you call them? The polarity of the functional group, and of course, electronic properties. Do they donate electrons or do they withdraw electrons? And if they do, what kind of effect do they show? Let me introduce to you what are aromatic compounds. As the root word suggests, aroma means smells good. All right, or rather they smell. Now in organic chemistry, aromatic compounds, they are formerly fragrant substances. Okay, but right now in the lab, they may not be fragrant to us, but certainly they smell. So they may even be pungent, which is a negative word for being bad smelling. In contemporary chemistry, we use this term aromatic compounds to describe a class of compounds they contain six member benzene light rings with three double bonds benzene from coal distillate if you go to germany or you live there you study there and suppose you meet a friend or somebody you say where can i get benzene do not be alarmed because in germany benzene means petrol just like in america they say gas they don't say petrol this is benzaldehyde you have a benzene with aldehyde group so you join the name benzaldehyde preservatives or you can get it from cherries, peaches, almonds. Toluene is a very oily solvent. This is, uh, you can find this in some of the petroleum that we pump into the cars. You can extract it from tolu balsam oil. So aromatic compounds exist naturally in many, many places. Steroid hormone, the estrone, energetic morphine, right see those in blue they are all aromatic and fluxoxetin some drugs here we call it Prozac it was a huge blockbuster drug antidepressant 